And what we want to do now is we want to step to yet another type of policy modification, and that is the so-called policy, policy limit. So let's introduce that huh, before the break. If we look at a policy limit, what we're going to do is that losses below uh, a value u, u is uh, the policy limit value. So if you have a loss below the value of u, then the insurance is going to pay out the full loss. But if you have a loss above you, then the insurance only pays the value of you. Now, in case you or your parents or your, your friends have, uh, for instance, a motor insurance product or a fire insurance product at home, you can, you can read the, the contract details and you will see that there will be such a limit being specified in the details of, of your contract. Yeah? So this is something which is very common and of course, this, this limit huh, for a, a useful insurance product for a house owner or for a, uh, somebody who drives a car, it should, of course, be quite high, right? Otherwise, there is, no, um, there is not much added value in, in, in buying this insurance product. But it will be specified. Huh? It will be specified at 20 million euro or something uh, like that. So statistically speaking, if you look at this policy limit, it produces a so-called right censored random variable. Um, so with right censoring in statistics, uh, we denote exactly the kind of operation that you see over here. That is, if your random variable stays below a certain value, you observe the random variable in, in, in full. But if the random variable is going above a certain uh, value, then we're going to top or cap this random variable, and we're only going to observe the uh, censored value, in this case, the value u. I do have a couple of additional sheets uh, to explain this idea of censoring and truncation in a better way. So I will, um, or it is my plan to discuss these uh, sheets today. So we will come back to this, huh? but, but keep this construction in mind. The policy limit, right censor. Now, what if, how does this, um, um, the, the fact that the policy limit is here, huh? how does this affect the distribution of our random variable? So let y be the loss random variable after the limit has been imposed. Then if you look at the distribution of y, then we can say the following, um, then we can give the following specification for the CDF of y. Uh, so if you look at the CDF of y evaluated in y, you're looking at what is the probability that y is smaller than or equal to y, now, what if this y is below u? Uh, then you could say, well, it's the CDF of x evaluated in y. But if the y is above or equal to u, yeah, then you know that all these losses, which reach the value of u or higher, they will be capped at the value u, right? So what you see here is that you're going to have a jump in your CDF. And you're going to jump here to the value of 1 at the point, um, at the point where y is equal to, to u, right? Because all the observations that we can register for the, value, for the random variable y, they will be less than or equal to u because that's the maximal value that we can observe after imposing this policy limit. Yeah? If we look at the PDF, of uh, our random variable y, while assuming that the underlying random variable x has a positive and continuous distribution, you will see here that the PDF of y is the PDF of x evaluated in y, if y is below u, and you will see that there is a probability mass put at the point y equal to u. Um, and this probability mass is equal to what is the probability that x, the underlying random variable, is going to go above uh, the value u, above the policy uh, limit. Yeah? So um, this is a mixed type of, of, of distribution, uh, because we have here a continuous distribution combined with a probability mass, a probability mass in this case put, equal, uh, put at the value of the policy limit u. Yeah? So that's important to keep in mind. It's a typical example of a mixed type of uh, distribution. Now, of course, what we can do, and this is uh, a little bit similar to um, 
the kind of expressions that I did with you on the, on the iPad. If you now want to put things together, if you look at uh, the policy limit of U, and if you impose this policy limit of U after incorporating an inflation of one plus R, then you can say that the expected, uh, the expected uh, per loss random variable is equal to the expression given here on the sheet. Yeah? And I will quickly do that because the calculation is super similar uh, to what we've been doing uh, so far. Because what we, can, uh, what we can say here is we start from applying the policy, val the policy limit after imposing the inflation at a rate of R. So we're going to look at the random variable Y being equal to 1 plus R times X. And we're going to impose this policy limit. Yeah? But if we impose this policy limit, that means what we're going to work with is the minimum of 1 plus R times X and U. And if we then want to calculate the expected cost, then the only uh, thing we need to calculate here is the expected value of 1 plus R times X, which U, right? Because that's exactly what's going to happen if you first impose this uh, uniform inflation effect of 1 plus R, and if you then impose the policy limit equal to U, and if you want to know what is then the expected cost on this contract, in case there is this inflation effect and in case there is this uh, policy limit equal to you, right? And now deriving this um, or doing this calculation, so getting the value for the expected value, that's going to go in exactly the same way as the derivation that I did on the iPad. But on the iPad, I worked with the expected value of 1 plus R times X wedge D. And now, of course, I'm not looking at the wedge D, I'm looking at the wedge U because I want to consider the effect of a policy limit equal to U. Right, so you recognize here uh, the expression that we uh, already obtained on the iPad, so uh, there is no need to, to redo uh, that. Yeah, there is no need to redo it, but, but I did redo it for some reason. So here again, uh, you see the detailed calculation in case you want to convince yourself that uh, this expression uh, works. Yeah? I was a little bit confused in my explanation. Uh, earlier on, I was hesitating when I was referring to the expected uh, per loss or the expected per payment or expected cost. But it is important to keep in mind that if you look at a policy limit, then the concept of a per payment and a per loss is no longer uh, relevant. Because losses that produce payments prior to imposing the limit, they will also produce payments after imposing the limit. But the only thing that changes is that the size of the payment is changed. And the size of the payment in, uh, with respect to the, uh, the second bullet here on my sheet, if your loss goes above the limit, in the original construction, you would pay the full loss X, but after imposing the policy limit, you would limit your payment to a value equal to you, right? But every loss, will still lead to a payment, but the size of the payment might be adjusted. So that's what we mean here huh, when we say, OK, there is no need to explicitly distinguish between the per payment and the per loss random variable in case you're studying the effect of a, of a policy. limit. And I want to start with this example. I'm going exam to discuss that with the sheets. So uh, the message that we got here on the sheet is that the policy limit and the ordinary deductible, they go together somehow. Whichever applies to the insurance company's payments, then the other one will apply to the policyholders' payments, right? And I think it's a nice reflection uh, that we're making here. So let's try to think about it with an example. So what happens if you look at a policy with a deductible of 500 euro? and you look at it from the insurance company's point of view. So if you look at this problem from the insurance company's point of view, then it means that you're not gonna reimburse the losses that are below the deductible of 500. And for the losses that, that go above this deductible, you would pay the part of the loss that, that is exceeding the 500 euro. And that's what's happening from the insurance company's point of view. But if you look at it from the policyholder's point of view, 
it means that the policyholder will have to pay the part of the loss herself, the part of the loss that stays below the level of the deductible. So that means that from the point of view of the policyholder, there is like a limit. There is a limit to the payments that she will have to pay from her own pocket. And that limit is uh, put at uh, 500 euro. That's the biggest value uh, that she will have to pay herself. Yeah? So from the policyholder's point of view, the presence of this deductible from the policyholder's point of view can be considered as a limit. It's a limit to the payments that you have to, to do from your own pocket. Yeah? So that's the kind of consideration that we want to make here. And if you flip this, if you look at it from uh, the other, if you look at it from the other way around, if you impose a limit of 3,000 euros to a policy, to an insurance contract, then that is from the point of view of the insurance company. So then we know that the insurance company is never going to pay more than 3,000 euros because the payments will be capped at 3,000 euros. If you look at it from the policyholder's point of view, it means that uh, the payments that the policyholder herself has to do, they are left truncated and shifted because uh, the policyholder will have to pay the part of the loss that goes above the 3,000 euro. So if the loss stays below 3,000 euro, then the policyholder does not have to pay anything herself. If the loss is above the 3,000 euro, then the policyholder has to pay herself out of her own pocket the part of the loss that goes above the 3,000 euro. So that acts like an ordinary deductible. Yeah. So it depends on which perspective that, that you take. But these two elements, these two policy modifications, they sort of go together. Yeah? And you see here um, some examples.